today with three very esteemed guests. Firstly, I shall start with Vicky Dillon, former respiratory nurse and now a Parkinson's disease activist. Vicky was a participant in the five-year GDNF trial that was filmed by BBC Two and aired as the Parkinson's drug trial a miracle cure. Unfortunately, I was pulled despite some noticeable successes, particularly for Vicky, whose symptoms improved by 63%. She says the programme opened hearts and minds to the reality of clinical trials and to living with Parkinson's. Next, I'm going to introduce John, Dr. John Stamford, a neuroscientist who headed up a research team into Parkinson's, and you got Parkinson's yourself, John, which is a bit of a bummer. An influential member of the inter uh, I beg your pardon, an influential member of the international park community. He's an author, a true gent, I might may say there, John, and the founder of Parkinson's Movement. John's got some very thought-provoking views on clinical trials. Next up we have Tapas. Former senior respiratory registrar and now associate medical director at the Havas Link. Welcome, everybody. First of all, I would like to ask you, Vicky, what do you think of the role of your clinical trials and what's your experience with them? Just well, briefly, Bob, briefly. Okay. Well, clinical trials are essential if we're going to get the cure. Um, my experience was that the drug I got worked. It was amazing. It changed my life. If anybody's seen the documentary, they could have seen the massive impact it had on our lives. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if any of you guys saw the BBC uh, programme, but it really was. Uh, shows how tough and relentless the symptoms of Parkinson's are. It's quite funny, actually, you notice, but Vicky and I were talking last night about mirroring each other's symptoms. We're doing but it when now. Vicky twitches, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> And it's really strange, but there you go. So, John, man, John, how, 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 what's your experience with clinical trials, and what do you think the, the, the real role of cl clinical trials is? Well, I, I'm often asked about that. Certainly, to, to my mind, we tend to think of uh, clinical trials as being perhaps the best way of actually finding new research, new, new drugs, but uh, I actually think you can simplify it further than that. I don't think it's the best way at all. I think it's actually the only way we can do this. I think to, to rely on serendipity to, to find new medications, I think is, is uh, living in cloud cuckoo land, frankly. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I told you John had some forthright views, and there's one there, but yeah, totally agree with you. Tap, next. How do you follow that answer? <laughs> <laughs> Carefully, I would say. Carefully. Um, yeah, cl clinical trials are, are put in very high regard in, in hospital, but the, the thing that has sort of opened my eyes a little bit after speaking to Mark and seeing the presentation today and also speaking to, to these guys about the, the experience, especially the experience that Vicky had, is we really overlook the human nature and the suffering that's going on during those trials. Um, even the ethics of giving somebody a placebo um, you know, it, it just, it was kind of heartbreaking to actually start thinking about that today. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're obviously hugely important and it's the, the cutting edge of medicine. Um, but it, it, I've just started to really think about the human cost of it and the huge cost that there is behind clinical trials. Talking of cost, I mean, and also a lack of communication around clinical trials. Vicky, how did you feel as a patient? Did you feel you had enough communication? Or? Well, initially, I was one of the first six guinea pigs, so we were treated like royalty. I mean, it was ridiculous. You were phoned all the time, you know, made to feel like a queen. You had everybody pampering you. Then they signed up another 36 patients when none of us had cocked it, basically. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> and you kind of Yeah, and then you kind of got forgotten about slightly. But then when the trial finished... You didn't hear another word. You, didn't, you were left with all this plumbing because we had eight hours of voluntary brain surgery to insert some pretty intricate plumbing. Yeah. Um, so we were left with all this gubbins still in our heads and nobody telling us what, we, what was going to happen to it. No further scans. It was just, we were cut dead. John? I should say also that these patients went through some extremely complex neurosurgery in order to be 
participants in this trial. Probably the best line in the documentary was given by Bryn Williams, who said that he had managed to get him out of uh, going to a One Direction concert. <laughs> Some people would join a clinical trial to do that, John. <laughs> Not me, I hasten to add. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so, recruitment's a huge challenge in clinical trials. I'm going to start again with you, Vicky. Obviously, you, had to, you were facing eight hours of brain surgery. Yeah. I mean, how did, you, how, would, how did you feel about that and going into a clinic? Was it a question of really sort of, you, want, you, you just wanted an end to the symptoms? Or how, why, what right. sort of encouraged okay. you to do it? Okay, I got myself on that clinical trial. In 15 years of being a patient, I've never been offered a clinical trial. So I got myself on. And I got myself on because of the treatment that I'd already been on, devastated my life. I don't know if people know about the treatment for Parkinson's, but we're put on drugs called dopamine agonists, which make you seek adrenaline and um, increase your dopamine. So hypersexuality, gambling, shopping, um, all the fun stuff in life, you <laughs> go and look for it, and it causes <laughs> devastation to many lives. And I racked up £75,000 worth of debt, had a lovely time doing it, but... Um, you know, I did a previous documentary called Sex, Lies and Parkinson's because I wanted people to know mm -hmm. that, you know, if a little old lady was going in spending all her pension and answer, they'd have to know why. But um, yeah. it was, I was slated for being honest. <laughs> I'll leave it up to everyone's imagination. Yeah, and I was a paediatric respiratory nurse specialist at the time. I was hauled in to where I worked made to take off time off work in case I was a threat to male members of staff and male. It was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I was desperate to get off that drug and brain surgery seemed like an easy option. Yeah. John, I mean, at setting up trials, say so you, you were the team leader looking into parking. What sort of things, we, we, was it, we, what sort of things did you take into account when you were setting up the trial? I, th I think it's, it's been touched upon by some of the earlier speakers. A lot of it is, is down to tiny little details. It's things like making sure that there's a disabled parking space available for somebody. Yeah. And as you know, in Parkinson's, when you, 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 many of the clinical trials, you have to be off medication. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're, off, we're able to walk on stage, neither Vicky nor I would be able to walk at all without medication. So simple practicalities like that, expecting people to turn up to the trial centres... Uh, unmedicated is, is, is asking people to, to part the Red Sea, frankly. I have to say, John, I, I, mean, I always refuse to go off my medication for exactly that reason, because it would really be just be too difficult for me to move about. Tap, though, what, from an HCP point of view, how, you know, what, what, what did you feel about the amount of communication you had to give to patients? Was it important to you? Yeah, so as I, as I became more senior, I was encouraged to do some clinical trials training. But um, I suppose you could say some damage had been done by that point in that sometimes when I was in clinic, um, and I know there's a, there's a comment about this in the white paper as well, uh, the principal investigator would just sort of catch me before I went into clinic and pass me a printed sheet of paper. And it... And I know we joked about the quality of some of those adverts for trials, but it, it probably looked even worse than that. It would just be a black and white printed paper with some lines of information on it. Um, and he or she would say, I'm recruiting for a trial. Do you mind just letting your patients know about it? And I'd have very little um, information um, other than what was on that piece of paper. And of course, when you're running a busy clinic and you've got about 20 people to see, it's not on the top of your priorities to start learning about this trial that you've not heard of. Um, and so I think quite a few missed opportunities, no doubt, from that. Because even if I did mention a trial to somebody, I was doing it without very, any training. And I was probably using words that were not optimal. And, and often, I think, an objection you would hear is, I don't want to be a guinea pig. And that that's more comes down to a bad communication of a trial. Um, I don't think I had the right ammunition in, in, in some of the in instances. Vicky, what would encourage you, what kind of wording would encourage you to get involved? I mean, I, get, I, mean, I, I keep on thinking of my own experience here that I would rather help other people and get involved in a trial to try and find a cure that I wouldn't be bothered to read if it, the, the small print in a trial. But 
That aside, for yourself, what would encourage you apart from what kind of wording? What would you like I think, to see? I think speaking to people who've been through the trial process, so having yeah. trial mentors and uh, yeah. buddies that have been through it and walked in your shoes, because nobody else actually knows what it feels like. It, you can read as much as you like, but it's, it goes in one over your head sometimes, especially if you're desperate, which many people who are waiting to go on trials are desperate. Yeah. Do you think, John, do you think people, do you think this like sort of desperation, do you think this is kind of not preyed upon, but do you think some of the trials sort of try and prey on the desperation of patients in any way? I, I think I'd be cautious about saying they prey on them. I have visions of vultures. Yeah, sorry, yeah, but, allegedly. Uh, I, I think it's, it's worth saying that one's judgment changes as the condition progresses. I mean, mm. if you asked me shortly after I was diagnosed, whether I would submit myself yeah. to a trial involving brain surgery, the answer would have been a clear no. That's a very good point, but actually. After yeah. 10, 10, 15 years, then one begins to look for, look for yeah. larger uh, endpoints. The, 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 it's basically a larger gamble, as I think is the essence of it. That's a really good point that I personally haven't thought of, because when you look at a chronic disease, it's like how, how bad do you have to get before you actually feel like, yeah, hey, you know, this is, this is getting, it's getting pretty grim to live with this now. I, I want to take part in the clinical. Did you ever hear that type of male patients? Is, is that something that occurred to you people with respiratory illness and they thought, hang on, I'm getting a bit too bad here. Was there, a, was there ever a cut off stage or? Yeah, I suppose it's one of the frustrations, isn't it? That uh, certain trials you have to be bad enough, if you like, to yeah. get on the trial in the first place. And then by the time you are bad enough for the trial, you've sort of missed the boat in terms of coming to hospital and engaging and, you know, and you might even be, in, in respiratory certain, you might even be putting a focus on palliation and it just seems a slightly inappropriate conversation almost to then start talking about trials if, if you know, it's hard to express perhaps, but we're always mindful of giving false hope. And, and I think this is where sometimes Training would have been great. I wish, I wish I had had better conversations and better knowledge of trials. I think one of the things that I was striking me during the presentation actually was that I've noticed the way the recruitment was done was very local to the hospital. They were, they were relying on yeah. who they could recruit face to face. They were missing out on so many people that were probably uh, applicable but from surrounding hospitals and that's where, that's where we can make a massive difference actually by raising awareness and facilitating transport and so on rather than just relying on the people in front of you. John, you have a point to make on that? Just a small point. I think it's worth saying also that the role of the patient community itself in interacting with yeah. other members of the patient community is vital. And it's worth remembering, if, if, if you have a good experience with a clinical trial in a clinical trial centre, you'll go out and tell somebody. Of course. But on the other hand, yeah. if you have a bad experience, you're going to go out and tell ten people. Yeah. So I think you know, the, the, it's, it's, it's far easier to, to uh, disenfranchise the patient community than it is to engage them. And, I think that needs to be borne in mind. Very, right, I've got a specific question which I'm going to ask you all individually, and that is about the whole idea of designing a trial around patients. Now, patient centricity, what do we need to do to take it beyond just a buzzword? How do we get clinical trials to be not just patient centric, but to encourage participation in them? in a positive way. To listen to the patients themselves and to listen to our experiences and not just listen but learn and take them into account and change practice accordingly. Yeah. John? I think you have to involve patients at every stage in the clinical trial. I think you have to go back rather than starting with your trial in which patients can be involved either as subjects or as commentators, you need to go back to the idea of maybe the, what the patients actually want and try and fit in with that. In essence, becoming part of their team rather than them becoming part of yours. And tap. Along the same lines, really. That, that idea of borrowing from the consumer world and making the whole process more of a rewarding experience. Um, potentially, you know, could we go towards a world where we're no longer looking at placebo-controlled trials? That would be incredible yeah I, I found yeah that blows my mind to think about that because I've been brought up to think a different way 
It's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, one thing that really baffles me about it is the concept that because we're patient, and I go back anybody that's ever heard my farmer onboarding talk, uh, which did very, very twitchily the other day, the actual meaning behind the, the meaning behind the original word patient is a Latin for patty. And that actually means to suffer. But just because we're patient doesn't mean we have to suffer. Well, I don't think any, well, no, we shouldn't have to suffer any, it, it, it's bizarre, it's, and we're not patient, patient either. Now, in, the, in this set, did Sledge have been given the tools that enable us to talk, not only to talk to one another, but engage with the people that are taking part in the trials as well? Because being our patient is not our job. And I'll take a, quite a very interesting quote from the actual white paper from Michael Mittelman. It says, being a patient, patient is not our job. But being involved in the clinical trial is a huge commitment and becomes part of our lives. There are so many practical aspects to factor in, like jobs, family. Every practicality should be looked into. The patient experience is crucial. And that's a quote from Michael Mittelman, who took part in the white paper, I believe. So does this mean in the design of trials, pharma need to see patients more as consumers and partners? Well, I think as well, we were always told we were part of the trial team. And yeah. I think if we're part of the trial team, pay us. Because some people might disagree, but for me, I work for myself. And um, taking time off to go to Bristol and having an infusion in my brain and then... Do they fly you? Do you have to fly? They sometimes. Down, yeah. Sometimes we drove down from Northumberland to Bristol or How sometimes I got the train. How long did it take? Six you? hours in the car. And, and you, then you had infusions. Infusions. Um, and then you had to go back. So you, and you felt pretty rough after your infusion. Yeah. So that meant if you work for yourself, you're taking two, three, four, five days off sometimes. And often I had to have somebody with me. So I'd, you know... Yeah compensate them. Yes, they cover costs, but they don't cover all the costs. So, yeah, I think they should be paid. Death, John, any thoughts on uh, that? I'm inclined to agree. I report a friend's story from a trial in the States. So, I mean, I won't name the exact uh, for trial funders, but they're based in Bethesda, Maryland. So we worked that one out. <laughs> but they, uh, they essentially wanted to fly her from Arizona up to Maryland for the trial, fly her back, and they barely covered her costs for the trial. And she said the worst part about it was she got half the allowance for lunch that the researchers did. Ah, that's just... That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, unfortunately, we're running short of time. And I did say I'd be on time, but... Uh, at this stage, I'd like to thank my panellists very much. I'd like to thank Vicky Dillon, Dr John Stamford... And Dr. Chapas Mukherjee, thank you very much indeed, thank you.